Canada is sort of where I think the future lies if wokeness gets the upper hand. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. As new research shows young people in Britain are unpatriotic, unconservative and increasingly exposed to left-wing ideas, I'm joined by Professor Eric Kaufman to discuss the politics of the future. Is conservatism dead? No, I mean, it depends which country uh, we're talking about. I think that the Conservative Party in Britain uh, represents ideas that come from the 1970s and 80s for the most part and aren't very relevant today. Um, but I also think that within conservative intellectual spaces and even in pockets in the Conservative Party and pockets in the think tanks, uh, there's vitality there. And I think people understand what some of the emerging issues are, where to go politically in terms of where the voters are, but that thinking has yet to penetrate into the sort of real decision-making centers of the Conservative Party. Can you tell us a little bit about you and your recent research? So yeah, I've gotten uh, two reports uh, on culture wars, broadly speaking, topics um, for policy exchange. One of them is on uh, young British people, and it's based on a survey with YouGov of 18 to 20 year olds, mainly concentrating on what they were taught in school. And then the second is just a general adult survey based on uh, the entire adult population, where we're looking at uh, people's support or opposition to um, culture wars topics by which I'm talking chiefly about issues around critical race theory in the past and the teaching of history in schools or cancel culture and threats to free speech and enlightenment values. So I'm trying to get a sense of where the British public is on these issues. I should say that I've done US versions of both of these surveys as well. Um, so yeah, that is sort of the basis of the report. And the, I guess one of the top line findings really is that in British schools, um, basically three quarters of British school children have heard one of five critical race theory or radical gender and sexuality concepts in school from adults. Um, and those concepts that I polled on were three race concepts around unconscious bias, white privilege and systemic racism, and then two sort of gender sexuality topics. One, the idea of many genders and the other patriarchy. So three and four of these British 18 to 20 year olds, and the 18 year olds were still in school, the 19 and 20s recently graduated, uh, said that they had heard from an adult or a teacher these terms. Uh, at least one of these terms. Moreover, the 18-year-olds, 78% uh, of them had heard uh, one of these terms. The 20-year-olds, it was like 68. So it's increasing over time, the exposure levels, which means this stuff is permeating more intently. So the argument that some uh, on the left had made that it's not being taught, oh, it's just small, it's just a few isolated incidents, the American school in London, this survey, which is a random draw of young people, really lays that to bed. This is a random sample, random draw. We found three and four have exposure to this. Um, and so that's the sort of top line finding in terms of school indoctrination, for example. And these are, by the way, I should say these are radical concepts that lack a basis in scientific quantitative measurement. Um, they come from radical theories and they are arguably bordering on conspiracy theory. So that's being taught in schools, even though schools have a duty uh, not to indoctrinate and to treat all issues impartially. And the other question we asked, by the way, was when these concepts were taught, were you taught an opposing view? Um, and only, well, in seven in 10 cases, they were taught this as fact with no opposing view or they were taught that this is the only respectable view, is to have the kind of critical social justice view. Only in three out of 10 cases were they obeying the law, if you like, and actually presenting an, an alternative respectable view. So what we have essentially is, you know, a significant majority of British school ch children are being taught radical theories on race and gender as fact. Um, and that is indoctrination, it is in violation of the law. So that is the number one. The other thing we found is in the wider adult survey, in the Water Adult Survey, if you actually look at people's answers to questions around critical race theory or cancel culture, um, what you find is the public as a whole, it's over two to one against um, 
what I would call the cultural socialist perspective, which is the kind of woke perspective that says um, all identity groups must have equal outcomes, number one, and number two, uh, we have to be hypersensitive to the to offending a member of any one of these groups, even if it's not an actual, uh, you know, not just an average member of these groups, but the most sensitive member of these groups. And by the way, that's obviously going to incentivize a certain weaponization of claims of I've been emotionally harmed by such and such a concept, J.K. Rowling being being on in, you know in the reading list or whatever. Um, so. What we see, that's, so that's the overall top line there, is that most of the public are against this stuff. They would be against teaching school children that Britain is a racist country, for example. Um, however, if you take the young population, 18 to 25, they diverge quite a bit from the average. So this is the other finding, is that the young people are actually a lot more woke. Now that's a very big generalization. Um, they're actually split. They're split 50-50, but the older population is sort of like 70, 80, in some cases 90 percent um, opposed. And so there's quite a big gap. I'll give you a couple of, couple of examples. Um, one is J.K. Rowling, should she be dropped by her publisher? You know? And there you see the young 18 to 25s are split 50-50. 50 percent of them who have a, an opinion say, yeah, she should be dropped which is a deeply kind of, for anyone who's into the enlightenment and free speech, that's deeply worrying. Um, so we have a lot of this progressive illiberalism in that young population, um, particularly the young female population, and I'll talk about that in a minute, much less so amongst young male uh, population. The other thing is that we, if we take a question, uh, questions that impinge on uh, Britain's history and tradition and, and national identity. So, should Winston Churchill's statue be removed from Parliament Square? Again, the 18 to 25s are split, whereas if you take the 50 plus, as with J.K. Rowling, they're like 85 to 5, absolutely not. Um, and so we're seeing big differences um, on generational lines as well. So those are kind of like the overall, the things that really jumped out the most, I'd say, from those reports. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. <laughs> So let's start with um, this idea that young people are, are increasingly woke or illiberal. Hasn't that always been the case that young people have been left wing? Not necessarily. I mean, the gap, say, if you take voting in this country, uh, support for labor and support for the conservatives, and you look at the under 25s and the over 65s, we can go back to 1964 in the British election study, and that's varied between sort of five to 20 points, roughly, right the way through to about 20. 2010, even, even pushing towards 2015, and then suddenly after 2015, the gap between the, the young and the old is at 40 or 45 points. So there is a much wider gap politically than there historically has been. That's the first thing. Now, of course, younger people have historically been to the left of older people, but it's just that the scale, the gap is much larger than it's been. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing I would say is that the young have been more to the left, but they've been more tolerant. So they've been more tolerant of, say, homosexuality, sex before marriage. It's a sort of in, an, in the direction of liberalism, let's call it. Uh, freedom, I should be free to do what I want. What we're seeing now, actually, is we're seeing illiberalism amongst the young. So no, people shouldn't be free to, to do what they want uh, if they offend group X, Y, or Z. Uh, and that's new, and in fact, in the U.S., where we see pretty much exactly the same trends, to some degree more extreme than here, but we're seeing very similar trends there, and there we've got data going back to the early 1970s. So we can look at an 18-year-old in 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020, and what that shows is the 18-year-olds, it's the same age, but they're getting less tolerant on certain things. So not for a, a communist, a militarist to speak, that's fine, um, but a racist to speak, right? These questions have been asked for 50 years, and on that one question, there's been a divergence. Now, it's not, I shouldn't say that this is all of a sudden with this young generation, no. It's been a process that has been gaining speed since, well, beginning sort of at a slow level with the baby boom generation, but accelerating. So actually, what I would say is this generation is simply reflecting decades of 
gradual cultural institutionalization of what I would call a cultural socialist worldview. Um, and so, yeah, I think this is new. The, there's no question we've seen a growth of, of intolerant absolutism um, amongst young people compared to young people in the past. So young people now are more intolerant than young people in the past around anything to do with um, historically disadvantaged identity groups. Now, there's this old adage that as people grow up, they become more conservative. Yeah. Do you think that's still true? Was that ever true? Um, it was true. We've got U.S. and British studies that show about a 20-point change between under 25 and over 65. So it, it's true, and I expect it to be true in the future. But that's typically around a 20-point change over the life cycle. Um, when we're talking about you know, a 40, 45-point gap between young and old, there's no way that's going to be able to make up that distance, e even half that distance. Now, of course, events could happen and, and things can change. But I, th I would sort of caution against people who say, oh, well, you know, young people, once they get a home and they get a job and they have a mortgage and they have a family, then they'll become conservative. Um, I don't think that's the case. They may, I think they will move to the right economically, but they're not that far to the left economically anyway. Um, they're not distinct, they're not so distinctive in their economic views from older people. It's their cultural views, um, views on this, this boundary between, say, speech and sensitivity. It's those sorts of issues where they are really diverging. Uh, and I don't see how that's going to be changed by acquiring material possessions, because it's fundamentally a spiritual and cultural thing. It's not a material thing. Um, and we can already see, for example, young people who happen to have jobs, happen to maybe have children and a home, are not radically different from those who don't have those things. So I don't think um, anything material. I mean, the conservative party who thinks somehow these people are going to morph magically into Tory voters, no, I don't think they are. Um, they're going to probably vote their values, and that means they're going to, we're going to see progressively, I would argue, say in 20 years, the median voter in Britain, I think, will look more like the median voter in where I come from in Canada, which is that the conservatives are, are a natural party of opposition. They come into power every so often, but they're not a natural party of government. They're a natural party of opposition. And I think Britain's heading towards that future. If I were to predict, um, given the views of younger people. Uh, now, having said that, I think I should say that the views of young men are much less different from the population. In it's young women who, who are the most different. Um, and so it's going to be interesting. And that gender gap is there amongst young people in Canada and the U.S. It's like a massive gender gap. What happens to that going forward is going to be really interesting to watch. Um, what I would say is I think that as this generation becomes the median voter, we're going to see big polarization on these cultural questions. It's already there, and I think it's going to be even more pronounced. Why are women more woke? Oh, and also, does that have an impact on the men who sort of want to follow their politics <laughs> to uh, gain advantages <laughs> in life? Well, I mean, I think it might because, you know, in these dating sites uh, where politics is increasingly being listed, uh, and, and studies have shown that has a bigger impact than a lot of other attributes, probably there's an incentive to at least fake it, um, given where a lot of women are. So yeah, I think uh, it may have that impact. I mean, some of the stats are really astounding. I mean, in the U.S., not as much in Britain, but in the U.S. case, for example, um, you know, the vast majority of women, st female students, for example, I think something to the tune of 90% are not Trump supporters um, in the top sort of 15 to 20 percent of U.S. universities. You know, if you take non-Trump supporting uh, women, the, the, per the percentage who would feel comfortable dating a Trump supporter is 7 percent. So, I mean, that's kind of giving you an impression of, of and, and even if we go outside the student population to the wider uh, young population, it, it looks almost as extreme as that. So clearly, that is a massive I issue. Um, but, yeah, what is, what's going to happen in the future will be very interesting, I think. I think, you know, we see certain divisions, say, within the female population now in the U.S., for example, people who are stay-at-home uh, mums uh, are, are massively more Republican than those who are, have a career, for example. Um, so how many, you know, how these things are going to play out over time is going to be really 
interesting to watch. In the recent midterm elections, one of the major indicators of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat is whether you're married or unmarried. And particularly with women, there was a big, there was a big gap. Once they became married, they basically became much more Republican leaning. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question there is to what extent does marriage change views uh, or to what extent do people with certain views, are they more likely to get married? Which, which getting married is now not as automatic as it used to be. And so to some degree, getting married is associated with certain things like maybe being Christian, maybe being suburban, you know, all, a, a number of things which are not necessarily something everyone will go through. Um, so I, I just don't think that these necessarily, these life milestones are gonna, gonna be magically to change it. Now what I think, we, we already know that in Britain, for example, people who don't go to university, who right now are not that different in their politics from people who do go to university. So this is already there by the time people set foot on campus. Universities aren't having that much effect. But um, what we see is the ones who don't go to university do become more conservative much more quickly. And now, I'm not saying they become radically more conservative, but it looks like their views converge more, whereas the ones who do go to university um, they converge less, but it's early days on the data on that. I want to talk about some of the reasons why you think, particularly in Britain, woke ideas have become so popular among young people. Okay. And, and, yeah. and that might be because the opposite, i.e. Toryism or Tories, are seen as so unpopular. And the sort of s the status of being a Tory is so low. I mean, from my own experience, <laughs> that word Tory is, is used as an insult among, you know, people early to, early right. to age, my age. Um, and, and it's really seen as a, as a sort of stigma. You know, if you're a Tory, you're, um, you're uncaring or, or you're mean or, or right. whatever. Right. So, so how much does status come into this? I think it comes into this, but I think there's a, there's a famous sociologist called Max Weber who had this metaphor that it's the culture that... that it's a bit like the switchman on a, on a track for a railroad. The culture kind of decides where, which track the train's going to go down. And then self-interest, like status, making more money, earning more profit, all of that stuff is the locomotive. And it's, and it's moving down a track. So what I'd say is the culture came first, sets up the incentive system, tells you what's prestigious, and then you go after it, right? So, uh, and I also say, you know, you asked about women as well. So women will always tend to take on whatever is the communal norm. They will tend to back the community norm uh, much more. So in, in 1970, female students were more conservative than men. They were more religious than men. Uh, you know, those were the norms. Now, the norms are cultural socialism or wokeness. Uh, so they're going to be more, uh, you know, they're going to, inf inf I won't say enforce, but they're going to support those, they're going to back those more, whereas the men are more likely to be contrarians. And so this is one of the reasons why we're seeing a difference. Now, of course, it is also the case that to some degree this ideology is a better deal for women to the extent that it is about, you know, equal, equal results, let's say, in the boardroom and women are underrepresented. It's a good deal. Now, obviously, we know on the gender critical feminist issues, there are perhaps threats as well coming out of this for women, but those so far haven't landed in their consciousness. I still think the main reason that they are supporting this is because they tend to back whatever are the community norms. And in, particularly in elite spaces and youth culture spaces, the community norm is a kind of culture of anti-Toryism. As you said, Ed West's book, Small Man on the Wrong Side of History, talking about the culture, which has really been there for decades of anti-Toryism. It's not that new, but yet it's kind of penetrated more deeply. And perhaps more in, importantly, the, the, the sort of nature of the ideology of left, that, that the left has, has, uh, is pushing has really pivoted from class to identity. And, and that change really took, began in the 60s. It began with Herbert Marcuse and the new left, uh, switching away from the proletariat to African Americans and, and de decolonization uh, you know, of, of non-European peoples. They became the stars rather than the proletariat. But it took some time for that to kind of permeate the consciousness. Uh, and, but now it, now it very much has. It's taken over uh, the left. It dominates academia uh, in terms of the left as well. Um, and, and yeah, I think they are now, of course, 
that's what's being taught in schools. That's what the influencers on social media and the cel celebrity culture and the movie industry are all, and the tech industry are all pushing these um, sacred values. And so I think that really informs a lot of this wokeness. So for, I'll give you an example that these sorts of, you know, the belief that Tories are kind of racist or sexist or transphobic, but especially say racist, you know, that lies at the core of a lot of the political prejudice over dating, which by the way bleeds into hiring prejudice. Um, and, and so the people who are, who say they wouldn't date uh, a Brexiteer are much more likely to say they wouldn't hire a Brexiteer, right? So this isn't just, a, you know, a playful thing around freedom of association. This is actually bleeds into breaking the law on, on you know, you can't discriminate on the basis of philosophical belief. Uh, that's in the EU law that's now uh, in British law. Um, but it comes, you know, the people who most believe that, like in the U.S. case, you know, white leftists who believe that white Republicans are racist, for example, um, who, believe, who agree to that statement are just much more likely to, to say that um, uh, people who disagree with me politically are immoral. So they're kind of moralizing politics into a sort of black-white thing rather than they have different values and maybe a different assessments of, of how the world works. So, so you mentioned Ed West's book. Yeah. And in his book, he basically argues that wokeism or whatever you want to call it, is the new religion, it's the new Christianity. And, and he also talks about the collapse of religion. And this is something that you know, many people comment on is sort of the decline in Christianity. Are people taking up politics as a, as a sort of replacement for religion? Is that what you see? I mean, you talk about morality. If people were gaining their sort of moral values from wokeism or celebrities or whatever, is that what's, is that what's happening? Um, I, I actually disagree to some degree with Ed West and Douglas Murray on this in the sense that, you know, Britain wasn't a particularly religious place even 20, 30 years ago, actually. Um, I'm not sure that's the, the big change. Now, that's changed more in the United States, yes, that's true. Um, but if you kind of look in detail at the survey data, for example, you know, whether you're religious or not doesn't make a huge difference to your attitudes on these woke issues when we take into account your party identification and your ideology, for example. Now, yes, being religious does influence whether you're a Republican or not. Uh, it does influence whether you're a conservative. But if you're secular and conservative or secular and Republican, then you're going to be anti-woke. Um, so, and, and we've had these sort of secular belief systems, you know, socialism and we be you know even to some degree nationalism is to some degree uh, one of these call them secular religions I don't think it's so very important this idea about religious loss as it is that we've just got a new version a new ideology a new secular religion compared to the old secular religions we've got a new one it is a mind virus it's like COVID and, and if you contract it you can then spread it and, and if institutions become super spreaders that, you know, so, so it's that model of a kind of a, um, epidemiological model that I would go with rather than necessarily this kind of psychological argument like, oh, people have a hole and the reason wokeness is there is because religion is gone. I don't necessarily think that's right. I mean, there, are, there is obviously a certain degree to which that's true, but I think uh, you could equally say that it's the decline of patriotism or, 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 or of some, or, or the decline of Social, you know, right? So I think this is more about a new ideology that um, has infiltrated. It started off in academia. Uh, we can see that there's a st studies of you know, 75 million academic abstracts. Look, and you can see that terms like sexism and racism were being heavily used already in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and it's not really till the 2010s the media catches up. So something happens in the 2010s with. Twitter and social media that allows academics and journalists to influence each other uh, and then clickbait journalism also maybe tr throw Trump in there, throw Brexit in there and, and all of that kind of leads to this very partisan media space emerging. I don't know how much you've studied the Cultural Revolution in China but it's mm -hmm. an interesting, interesting thing that people always refer to and they make these comparisons, you, you know, you can look at students destroying yeah. their teachers and I mean much more violent way um, but but there are comparisons do you think that's a legitimate thing to, to look at and to study and to, and to sort of make conclusions from yeah I think it absolutely is and and, and George Orwell in, in 1984 in a way 
foreshadows the Cultural Revolution. Um, so why is it, you know, why is it it's sort of the right metaphor? Okay, a couple of things. One, the same things that today's cultural socialism are attacking, um, the past, historical narratives, uh, proper names, traditions, uh, the Cultural Revolution was going after what it called the four olds, you know, old Chinese traditions. It wanted to wipe the slate clean to the year zero. So we're seeing that uh, occurring with all the statue, statue toppling and, and the sort of rewriting of history. But then the other part of this is the, is the George Orwell, two plus two equals five, you must believe it, say it until you believe it, that, that truth becomes political. The meaning of words becomes political. And that, that also, um, I think, is, is something that comes out of that cultural revolution, that reality and science is, is essentially doesn't exist. It's all what's, whatever's politically correct. Um, and we're seeing that now if you just, you know, what is a woman, for example, or is, is, is sex a spectrum? And, you know, we're seeing the denial of science in, in this area. Um, we're seeing sort of, uh, let's just say, well, you know, incredible disinformation on the extent of racism, for example. The, Canada has, I mean, it's worse in North America in many regards, but Canada has something called the, the it had a, what is called the residential school system for indigenous Canadians. Um, which the government, essentially, the media has all called a genocide. And there was an incident, and, and it's not even remotely close to that. It, it, it's a, there was a, sort of an assimilationist element. There was a schooling element to it. There were, you know, there were people who were undoubtedly mistreated. But what, there was, there's no actual attempt to sort of say, well, were the children who went to these indigenous, you know, these residential schools, were they treated worse? than children who went to day schools on the reserve. What are their health outcomes compared to people in non-indigenous settings at that time? You know, no attempt at anything objective or truth-seeking. It's a narrative and everyone's got to bow. And the whole Canadian parliament even endorsed a sort of genocide resolution and it's, it's just mass hysteria. It's unbelievable. Now, it's nothing as extreme as, as that has occurred in this country, but it's just to say that, yeah, people are jumping on these bandwagons of hysteria and it's not fact-based and that is very much the way the Cultural Revolution operated. Uh, incidentally, my, my dad was briefly in China during the Cultural Revolution and saw all these red books and all these kids sort of uh, attacking different states. It's quite a, quite a, a remarkable episode. Um, and then, but the same thing was happening in Stalinist Russia too. And, and with that Cultural Revolution, there's I, I mean, from what I've read, there's somewhat of a myth that it was all orchestrated by Mao, whereas I think that the, the role of the Chinese state was perhaps limited compared to the sort of, as you say, the virus element of this, the sort of infection, the natural infection among young people of sort of this mass hysteria that sort of grew, not, not by government, but by just ordinary people. So perhaps that's an interesting comparison as well. Let's talk about the minority of conservatives who, of, of young people who are conservatives, because that is an interesting, I'm, I'm interested in that group of people. I mean, I right. count myself as one of them. Um, I see a lot of social media posts that are, that are conservative, conservative memes. I see a lot of young people my age who I know just, you know, looking at the stuff on TikTok, on Instagram and all of the, you know. Right. So I think there is a sort of, uh, I don't know, there's a, a countercultural, um, movement or something. Uh, what do you make of that? Do you think there has been, is there any significant conservative minority? Has there been any sort of countercultural movement that you've seen in the UK or in the US among young people? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely there has been and you're right about this. And, and it's obviously, it's the survey data, some surveys will pick this up. Like, so there has been the odd survey that shows Gen Z, which is sort of the youngest, your generation probably, compared to the millennials being more opposed to cancel culture than the millennials. Um, there is some, there are some countries like Canada where Gen Z also is more, is, is relatively conservative compared to the millennials. So there's, there are some places where we're seeing something that's distinct. And also there's been surveys showing that higher sort of internet use or getting most of your news or, or I'm trying to remember what the actual metric was, but I think more time online was correlated with being more conservative. And I think part of what's going on is that the online space is where is much more even. And in fact, a lot of the big influencers are right of center. 
uh, online because it's more of a free space. Yes, there are there's shadow banning and there are ban you know there, there are things that tech firms can do, but only really at the edges. Um, there's it is still a much freer place than the institutions, which tend to be more captured, right? So something like universities, it's it's very difficult to get a job, be promoted, get published if you are uh, breaking taboos. Whereas in the media, and, and also it's very hard to create a new university, right? You, you can't just open up a new university. It's, there's established hierarchies and rankings and donations and all this. So yeah, because that media space is, is more open, um, we're seeing that there are more, uh, you know, countercultural influences online and, and young people are accessing those. Now, there is still a big gender difference. I mean, again, I mentioned like in Britain, the young men are really not actually that woke in, in many ways, even if you compare them to older generations. So it's, it's very much certain categories. I mean, women, LGBT, which on some surveys, at least if you ask people, I mean, in my survey, it was 29% of the 18 to 20s were LGBT. Um, in the U.S. surveys that I've seen, it's anywhere from like 21 to 30 percent now just, sorry just yeah, to, yeah. just to clarify that number yeah is, is that representative of young people uh, you know 29 percent represent uh, sort of uh, identifying as LGBT or is that that seems really high to me but right so there's a couple of things to note you know one is that that number might be inflated so this the census numbers where we have them are you know a half or a third of that now I, I still think the the pro the actual number is is somewhere around 15 but a lot of, so the, 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 fast, the, the largest segment of that would be, say, female bisexuality. Um, a lot of that female bisexuality is just identification, not behavior. And we know that, again, from U.S. surveys where they actually ask about sexual partners. Uh, so, so, yeah, an increasing number of, of these LGBT identifiers are not actually LGBT in terms of behavior. It, they may have flickering sentiments. But uh, what I'm saying is, in a way, that there are these certain subgroups within the young population. That chunk who will say I'm LGBT, even when they're probably not, uh, would be one of them. Um, women much more so than men. Because, uh, because it's so fashionable to be LGBT. Uh, well, yeah. So, so the sort of social pressures are different, and this, and maybe it's interesting, or it's seen as being marking you out from the herd. Um, it is interesting that ethnic minorities in Britain are less woke. On these surveys, for example, they were less likely to support political correctness than whites. And I think that's interesting because I think they're, com they're not as immersed in the same youth culture to the same extent, perhaps. Um, so, and, and, and what you actually see is that it's the same in the U.S. The white uh, young population, is in, well, the white population is more politicized, more polarized um, than the minority population. And, and that's showing up as well. Uh, in the survey, but but yeah, so I would say I don't. If I had to predict, I don't think that the young people in this country are going to get more left wing. And there is some evidence, let's say, from the last sort of, you know, eighteen to twenty one, is a little bit more conservative in this country than twenty two to thirty. Let's say, so I don't think it's going to get any more left uh, and any more woke. Um, and then there are reasons for this, including psychological reasons, but also the fact that unlike the Cultural Revolution or Stalinist Russia, because of the online space, because of the counterculture that actually, despite the shadow banning and despite the censorship or whatever, is still reasonably free to get its message out. So between that and people's psychology, I, I don't see it getting any, any more woke. I think it's probably reached about as far as it'll go. but. Having said all that, I think that if you have a, a population that's 50-50 on J.K. Rowling becoming uh, the median voter, then the power of that ideology is just going to be hugely increased, especially in the elite institutions where these people are going to be overrepresented. People like Andrew Tate are interesting. I mean, it, yeah. you can debate whether he's conservative. I don't think he really is conservative, but he's certainly not woke, and he's very okay. anti-woke. Um, and he, he was fantastically popular among, among many young men. And as you say, they, despite all the, they banned him from everything, but he's still, mm. he's, he's still seen by many people, I'm sure, you know, and all, he can get past all these bans or whatever. Um, and Jordan Peterson is another one. And, you know, so, so there are some figures who, who, who really are popular, um, who aren't woke among young people. And, and, and that is a phenomenon that perhaps is explained by your answer. Let's talk about 
the schools. I'm interested in, in British schooling in particular and, and, and the research that you've done. How reliable is the data on this stuff? So I'd be interested to know whether, for example, in your polling you asked uh, a sort of control question, uh, perhaps a made-up term that no, you know, you know what I mean, that no one had ever heard of, and, and see how many people were just instinctively answering yes. Yeah, that's a really good question, and I think that's sort of been put to me. And I think you know, if I had to do it over again, I might have asked, you know, that they, were you taught that the moon landings were faked or something? I, I mean, my hunch on this is we're not going to get. We may get a few percentage points, um, but I, I could be wrong. I'm willing to be uh, disproven by if someone wants to do that, and, and I may do it in the future. What, would I, what I would say is this, however, if you look at um, the terms that we polled on, there's a lot of variation. So only 20% said they were taught that there were many genders. Now, you, it could be that, you know, so the question is, is that number actually zero, and therefore we should subtract 20 from everything? I'm a bit skeptical. I mean, I think that maybe the number may be less than 20%. I don't know exactly what it is. Um, but I don't think it's zero. And there were other terms where we had, you know, I think 55. I think for patriarchy, it was something like 55. So there's a lot of variation within the terms that we polled on. So it's not just, oh, yeah, tick, tick, tick. I think there is a, a meaningful difference there that people are, are picking up on. Also, there were some differences in exposure levels depending on, you know, so for example, more diverse urban areas, there was more of the critical race theory terms being taught, which kind of makes some sense in a way, right? So, so I just think that uh, it may be the case. I'd, li I'd love to go back and do it again, but um, I don't think it's going to amount to much. Is this down to teachers, activist teachers, who are sort of more to the left? Uh, I, it's a combination. So we asked whether people had heard it from teachers or, or heard it from an adult, which might be, for example, um, a member of an activist organization in assembly or giving a talk. And it's kind of a rough split 50-50 uh, in most cases. So th there are activist teachers that are pushing this, and there are external third-party contractors who are bringing in race and gender ideology. And there are a lot of these providers which report from Don't Divide Us, DDU did using freedom of information requests and they picked up like in the councils that actually responded to them which was only a minority you know a significant number uh, were essentially s telling their schools to teach this stuff so it that research pretty much reinforces what we found uh, and it makes us makes sense so you have these external organizations and radical teachers do I think most teachers are doing this no um, but I think the question is whether um, radical teachers are doing it and whether head teachers are allowing people to come in and essentially push these, these radical theories. And I think for the most part they are because a lot of this is also in the education schools, so teacher training, uh, particularly the more prestigious education schools. And the, the curriculum they're teaching is sort of shot through with these assumptions around white privilege and systemic this and that. Uh, again, which are not scientifically based, but then that discipline in education is not also necessarily, they're not going to stick to uh, what I would call positive fist, falsifiable scientific type studies. They're going to go for these meta theories, quasi conspiracy theories, such as systemic racism and patriarchy, which uh, is all about academics citing academics, citing academics who are essentially more or less conjuring this stuff up as a, as a theory, right? So, yeah. but, but those ideas aren't actually in the curriculum, as in the national curriculum. Obviously, the conservatives aren't that stupid. Um, so wh why are they? Well, I'm up? not. I'm not sure whether they are that stupid. I mean, but I would say that um, teachers have a lot of freedom, of course, to to you know to go off piste and to use download materials and, and teach them in class. So it's not the case, I think, that they are only teaching to the letter of a national curriculum. Um, and so a lot of this material is kind of coming in that way. And so part of what DDU are trying to do is, you know, provide counter materials. But of course, unless you have teachers who are interested in using those counter materials, they're not going to get taught. It's interesting because I imagine if I was a head teacher, unless I was overtly political or anti-woke, then I probably, you know, the sort of default position is probably to let this stuff happen. Um, or you know to, to teach this stuff for, for all right. the reasons that, that people can can talk about but is it has there been a significant shift in teachers becoming more left-wing in recent years 
That's an interesting question. So, I, I, yeah, I think that, you know, in the days of corporal punishment, I mean, I'm not sure they always were left-wing, and obviously there were a lot more male teachers, but that's not even the male-female thing. I, I just think there's probably been a shift. Now, we know where we've got proper measures um, is in academia and in journalism. And in the case of the U.S., for example, the shift has been something like one and a half left to one on the right in the mid-60s to sort of five to one left to right in journalism and about six to one in, in left to right in academia. But that's including, that's right down to the sort of two-year colleges and the sort of not particularly elite universities and in all disciplines. If we just take social sciences, it's gone so from something like three to one left to right in the mid-60s to anything between 12 and sort of 20 to one. I mean, it's, it's gone probably, let's say, 12 to 14 to one in the U.S. In this country, it's about nine to one left to right, and that's been a big change from about one and a half to one in the mid-60s. So now the teachers, the data that I've seen from YouGov's panel would suggest the teachers are not as left-wing as academics. Um, academics, if academics are sort of 75 percent on the left, teachers might be, say, 60, 65. They're not as left-wing because there are different ways to become a teacher. So I don't think it's as extreme uh, as in universities, but what I would say is that there's no question that the dominant strand, uh, um, the dominant share, are are leaning left, and as has probably been true for a while. But the content of what left means has shifted from, you know, class and and socialism to cultural socialism and identity. Okay, so we've had a conservative conservative government for 12 years. Right. Uh, this has happened under their watch. Are they aware of the problem? Do they understand? the problem and why have they let this happen? Well, a couple of reasons. I mean, I think the Conservative Party are are largely a business liberal party, a bit like the FDP in Germany. They're not, for the most part, they are not a sort of national conservative or populist conservative party or even a cultural conservative party. Um, most of the MPs, there have been MP surveys. Uh, one was conducted by Tim Bale and his colleagues uh, and published a few years ago, which showed that the typical Tory MP surveyed was very far to the left of the typical Tory voter. Um, and actually to the slightly to the left of the average voter on cultural questions. On economic questions, they're way to the right of their base and of the average voter. So who are these people? They are basically people who came through elite universities, became Thatcherites, read their Hayek um, and are essentially libertarian economic liberal types and you saw that very much. You see that in Johnson, you see it in Truss and, and despite Johnson's to some degree populism but he's actually in many ways a you know global capitalist liberal. Uh, Truss and Quarteng again are even more that way inclined. So the sort of dominant intellectual strand in the party is is from the 1980s and hasn't really shifted. Um, the cultural conservative people like the Common Sense Group and Kemi Badnock and, and maybe Suella and, and a few of these people, they are a minority and they're not really in control of candidate selection. Uh, and so until that occurs, uh, now, and, and you can see through the Cameron administration, Ter Theresa May, they actually put this stuff on steroids. I uh, mean, the uh, 20, you know, the, the uh, Equality Act, uh, 2010 and burning injustices and all of these things um, very so much they are, this. yeah, they, they've been fueling this. They kind of wanted to be on the good side of uh, the race industry, of the activists. Um, and so they've, they've helped to perpetuate all of this stuff with very little pushback. Yeah. Do you think there's a, there's a complete void in conservative ideology in Britain at the moment? And what I mean by that is conservative politicians today would probably be uh, sort of vocally anti-woke you know, in their, some in their would, statements, yeah. <laughs> some would. Many of them, as you correctly, actually, you're completely right, many of them wouldn't be, but but you would expect Rishi Sunak or, or Suella Braveman or whoever, you know, some senior conservative politicians would, would yeah. probably yeah. be anti-woke in their statements. But do they present their own philosophy? Do they present their own vision of society or their own sort of uh, conservative belief on how, on how we should structure our lives or whatever? Do you know what I mean? Where that, perhaps that void was, was filled by Christianity before, I don't know, but, but there's no, yeah. it seems to me they have no sort of viable alternative that they're proposing. 
No, I mean, that you have sort of, they've got economic philosophies, you know, whether it be more uh, trussite libertarianism or the one nation economic conservatism. They're much more comfortable talking about uh, bread and butter economic issues because you're not going to get canceled for, for talking about economic issues. You're not going to be accused of being a racist on the BBC. Um, what's lacking is the kind of the courage to be able to say, actually, we are going to have an audit and we're going to remove funding for uh, DEI uh, initiatives across the civil service that are taught in this way. So uh, that's diversity, inclusion. Yeah, sorry, diversity, equity, and inclusion, diversity training. Um, and also, we are going to, to ensure, we're going to write guidance. So for example, they could insist that the guidance from the Department of Education defines anti-racism only as traditional individual on individual racism, not as systemic. So what they should be saying is systemic racism does not fall under the consensus value of anti-racism. It's a contested concept, should not be taught in the schools. If you had a government that had A, the understanding, B, the knowledge, and C, the, the, the guts, um, that's what they should do. Now, of course, you're going to have a fight with, with the woke establishment that runs the teachers' unions, etc. But you've got to have that fight. I mean, if you compare politicians here in the Conservative Party with pe people like Glenn Youngkin, Ron DeSantis in the United States, who have been much more vocal and not only willing to say some things, but to, to enact policies, to join up the policies with the campaigning, to campaign centrally, force the other party to answer, okay, you're teaching this, that, that the U.S. Is, is, is a racist country in schools and, and you're, you know, whites have privilege. Uh, I don't think we should do that. Uh, how, you know, or you're teaching about that there are many uh, sexes or whatever it happens to be. Um, I don't think that should be in the curriculum. And force the other side to actually defend that practice. And if they defend it, they get punished at the polls. And that hasn't happened here. And one of the other problems, and we may be getting too inside baseball yeah, yeah, here sure. a bit, but uh, this is something that I've, I've looked into for a long time, you know, particularly in the civil service, why wokeism has become so prevalent, um, examples of it, etc. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the, conserv the way that the civil service is structured in the UK is different to in the US. Obviously in the US they have political appointments, so they have I think over 40,000 roles that are politically appointed. Republicans come in, they put their own right, people in, right. they've got ideologically those people are generally on the Republican right. side, whereas in the UK we have this sort of supposedly impartial civil service, which I think some of the stories that you, you know that we've done at the Telegraph would would perhaps challenge this idea that the civil service is in any way impartial when it comes to woke and cultural issues anymore. So the Conservative Party have to or, and politicians they have a couple of advisors, spads who are right. who are who are conserv non, you know who are potential supposed to be conservative, many of them aren't. Right. Um, they've got a lot on their plate, they've got to be dealing with a series of crises that the country is facing. You know, do they even have time to, to think <laughs> about this stuff, to, to, to start to tackle any of this stuff? I, I doubt it. I mean, I've spoken to SPADs and they do a brilliant job, some of them, but, but you know, how, how, can, how can they, as sort of the dozen people, change this, <laughs> change this stuff? Do you know what I mean? So, so yeah. to be, weirdly, to be fair to the conservatives, they actually uh, face a, a structural problem in the UK in particular Whereas in the U.S., maybe it's slightly different. I, yeah, I don't actually think it's that all that different. I mean, a lot of the same problems uh, occur in terms of the age, with the agent, government agencies in the U.S., and they tend to be, you know, woke, and it's very hard to sort of get people uh, to get them changed. Um, so I think it is a similar problem. I mean, I think that actually, in some ways, things are more favorable in the U.K. because central government has more power, there's not a state level uh, to deal with, and there's not necessarily the same courts as your constraint. Um, but when you really, if you really look at the differences, the differences have to do with candidate selection because of the primary system, because of the way Trump, and I disagree with many things Trump has done, and certainly with the whole Trump cult, but there is no question that the older Republican establishment was just about low taxes, had to be replaced with uh, candidates that more or less reflected, that reflect their voting base much more closely. That hasn't occurred here yet. It is still a kind of establishment that's running the Conservative Party, and they have not been overthrown the way the Republican National Congress establishment has been overthrown. And that's, I think, the key process. Now, of course, it's the case in an economic crisis, economic issues are the most important issues, but this is you know, my point on this is this is a management issue. This isn't really, shouldn't necessarily be the way you define yourself 
as a conservative. Yes, we want to manage, we want to give shorter waiting times in the NHS, we want to have uh, lower taxes, we want to have more economic growth. Maybe we have to sacrifice one, maybe we can't do lower taxes when we're in an economic crisis, fine. I mean, I just think these are kind of very s narrow parameters you're operating in, uh, strict constraints. I don't think economics should be the way in which conservatism is defined now, when the, especially since the major threat, I mean, these are not just tiny little culture wars on campus. This is sort of core Western values. I mean, do you believe in freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, uh, objective truth, science, um, national uh, cohesion, all of these things are kind of core these should be more important than a few points, uh, per, you know, tenths of a point on GDP. And yet, it's no, it's all, the obsession with defining conservatism by, hey, we're going to, you know, have a higher GDP somehow. Um, I think that's mistaken. And so I think what we need is a kind of revolution within conservatism to somehow deselect the MPs that are just, essentially don't care about culture, they only care about uh, libertarianism. I just very briefly to end the yeah. interview, this is slightly off, off track, but I just okay. do want to talk about Canada for sure. a second. Um, that's where you're from. Yeah. And there's, Canada has, I've, I keep reading these incredible articles about, about Canada recently, in particular about their um, uh, uh, euthanasia mm. um, pro pro programs. Um, and the, could you see, is Britain heading in that direction? And can you just talk a little bit about how Canada, or the sort of the politics of Canada and the social politics as well? Yeah, I mean, Canada is sort of where I think the future lies if wokeness gets the upper hand. So in Canada, for example, wokeness is not just in the institutions like universities or the media. It's, it's actually, we've got a woke prime minister, a woke administration. They're trying to enact, uh, for example, um, uh, laws that'll make it very, you know, very easy for the government to censor, freeze bank accounts, as we saw with the trucker protest. Um, to pursue uh, episodes of collective mass hysteria, like the, the claim that there were 215 bodies in mass graves found in this indigenous school. It's complete nonsense. Never been walked back, despite no evidence for this. But that's sort of where a country goes when there is no conservative opposition, or it's a weak conservative opposition. I should say that the only real difference between Canada and Britain is that, or, or in the U.S., is that in Britain and the U.S., the, light, the right and the left in the electorate are roughly evenly balanced. Whereas in Canada, and this has been true for a long, long time, the left has had about a 60% versus the right 40%. Excluding Quebec, which is more like, like Britain and the rest of Europe. But if we take the English part, it's, there's been sort of a 60-40 split. And that allows, it just changes everything. It essentially means that the, the party that's naturally in power is going to lean left. Uh, and it's going to be difficult for the right to get in. They have to, the right has to kind of compromise on a lot of these things. Political correctness is much more intense or, or is more intense there. Uh, you can't talk, for example, about limiting immigration. It's impossible. Um, so that sort of level of uh, the Overton window of acceptable debate is just much narrower. So are Canadian conservatives far more left-wing than, than even British conservatives, for example? Or uh, they are on cultural, in cultural issues. So even the current populist leader of the conservatives is um, extremely timid on anything to do with immigration, wokeness. The only thing he'll talk about is economics, except for the only place he's sort of gone a bit out on the limb is uh, abolishing funding for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which is, I, I'm 100% behind that, but it's not enough. You've got to start Steady tackling rule. Yeah. this industry. And so far, even a so-called populist like Polyev has not been willing to do that. So that kind of shows you the difference. Uh, but yeah, in terms of, you know, you, Canadian universities will openly advertise for only, say, black or indigenous candidates. They, you know, they will, it's open discrimination. Uh, you know, you have these laws which would essentially criminalize, you know, it, it seems like it would criminalize saying a woman is an adult human female. You know, so there's a whole range of these quite censorious bills that the uh, Trudeau government has been trying to enact. Um, so if you are a young conservative in, in Britain, and you know, I'm sure many of them are maybe thinking about emigration. Uh, you know, where <laughs> where where uh, where would they go? Where should they go? Sh should they go? obviously they shouldn't go to Canada? No, I mean, that's not definitely not. not. <laughs> maybe, but maybe Florida, maybe Hungary. I mean, where do you think is sort of well? I so so by Poland? yeah. I mean, Europe is obviously. I think Europe is in many ways more conservative than Britain. Um, number one, I mean, most European countries. I would say. North America, so the U.S. is 
is more like 50-50. And yes, of course, red states are going to be conservative majority, places like Florida um, and, and Texas, and especially because the Latino population has been shifting to the right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I certainly wouldn't give up on Britain. I, I, I would say that, uh, you know, there's probably going to be a labor government. Wokeness will probably get worse. But on the other hand, uh, it's not as much of a lost cause. I think Canada is, is, is a, in a much worse place than Britain. So uh, Britain is certainly not the worst. <laughs> on an optimistic note, thank you so much, Eric, for joining us. Thanks, Steve.